In this video, we're going to continue focusing on the antebellum South in the years from about 1830s through the 1850s. In this video, we're going to focus on uh, the way slavery sort of developed in this period. Now, uh, much of the life of slaves was the same as it had been before, and I've covered a lot of slavery in the earlier videos on the colonial early national period. But in the antebellum age, you're really going to see uh, some new domestic slave trade develop. The process of hiring out slaves is going to develop, and an illegal international slave trade is going to develop. So I'm going to talk about those in this video here. Uh, it is certainly ironic to start out with that the uh, slavery continued to spread in the antebellum age, even as the nation during the antebellum age arguably became more democratic. And there was an historian named Kenneth Stamp who uh, published a, one of a very, very famous book called The Peculiar Institution, referring to the institution of slavery as odd in this respect. And if you ever hear the phrase peculiar institution, it means that they're talking about slavery. With the constitutional ban on international slave trade, uh, taking effect in 1808, and with declining prices of slaves in the Chesapeake, with higher prices for slaves in the Southwest, not surprisingly, a really robust domestic slave uh, trade developed. Uh, in the Upper South, much of the land was already owned, and thus there, there really couldn't be the physical expansion of cotton production. But because that was where the majority of slaves resided, and because the price of tobacco had dropped, the price of slaves dropped there, while the cotton industry was growing so much, the demand for slaves, as I say, was growing in the Southwest. So again, there was a, a result of the robust domestic slave trade between the Upper South and the Southwest. The new antebellum domestic slave trade was carried on by a diverse range of businesses. Businesses that sold farm equipment and animals often carried a, quote, line of slaves. Real estate companies sold slaves, often including slaves with the purchase of land as an incentive. The slaves were sold at estate auctions, and the news about the sales would be published in newspapers. Even charitable, benevolent organizations dealt in slave buying to raise money for their cause. Slave traders were everywhere in the Upper South, Virginia and Maryland. They hang out at taverns or country fairs or travel around trying to learn of what slaves were for sale. They might follow bankruptcy filings to see if any slaves were becoming available or follow obituaries. When plantations were sold, they would, they would often find slaves as part of the uh, estate sale. Baltimore, Richmond, Norfolk, and Charleston were the principal trading spots in the older upper and eastern south. This is where the domestic slave trade would begin. There were numerous slave trading spots in uh, slave markets, even in Washington, D.C., one within blocks of the capital. Matter of fact, foreigners in an antebellum age would uh, when they're in D.C., would go to the slave auction in Penn's sort of as a tourist novelty attraction, not the best thing for uh, America. In the new lower and western south, the southwest, Montgomery, Memphis, and New Orleans were sort of the largest depots, the, the terminus of the slave trade. New Orleans had multiple large and notorious slave markets where you could buy the newly arrived slaves. Uh, you can see a, one of the historical markers here on the left and also uh, an ad taken out in the paper saying we've just received from Virginia and Middle Tennessee a new batch of slaves. At these markets, the slaves would be locked up and then brought out at the uh, auction, and then there'd be a, a live auction where they would inspect the... Uh, the slaves as, you know, in a obviously degrading way. In some instances, the domestic slave trade actually marched people overland, chained together. Other times, they were sent by boat all the way around Florida, and that's why part of the reason New Orleans was so big. Here you can see, uh, if you get part of the ship that they've kind of taken out here to show you where the, all the slaves sitting on the bottom there. Here is a slave ship's manifest showing its cargo of slaves. 
In the Upper South supplying the slaves, there is always a fear that as they continue to sell slaves, their supply would be exhausted. So, uh, so they developed a, a more concerted effort to breed slaves. Uh, indeed, breeding became so profitable in the Upper South that slave girls became mothers at only 13 and 14 years old. By the time they were 20, some had as many as five kids. Slave owners and sometimes uh, would, would sometimes give you know prizes or special privileges for producing a lot of kids. Some mothers even won their freedom by producing between 10 and 15 kids. One Virginia planner boasted that her women were quote uncommonly good breeders unquote. A new baby was worth $200 the moment it drew its first breath unquote. The domestic slave trade and breeding practices ensured that many black families were broken up. Husbands were separated from wives, mothers from children. Some traders even specialized in selling young children. While groups of slaves were often uh, advertised, in reality most were purchased as singles because of the cost. Some whites tried to rationalize that family ties among slaves were loose or non-existent because they were inferior and thus sort of indifferent to separation. In reality, of course, the separation was one of the most cruel, or the, the, probably the cruelest aspect of slavery. Uh, a number of runaways left simply to find their loved one. Interestingly, some historians have concluded that African-American culture adapted as a result. You see the importance of extended families and friends to ensure a sufficient upbringing. The old African uh, statement, you know, it takes a village, as the, old, as the saying goes. The demand for slaves was so high by the end of the antebellum age that the process of hiring out slaves grew. It was kind of like renting them. And they would, they would do this for a variety of reasons. The purchase price of a slave outright, for example, might be too high for some people. Or people might simply need a slave services temporarily and saw no need to purchase one permanently. Still others might calculate that with the increasing price of slaves and with slaves increasingly living into older age, when the, when the, the owner might have to supply, uh, have support for that slave, it was simply more economical to rent a slave. The practice of hiring out of slaves is almost as organized as that of the slave trading. Slaves were hired out by the day, by the month, or by the year. The renter promised food, clothing, shelter, and medical aid for the slave. If the slave ran away, the rent continued. If the slave died, rent stopped, provided that the renter could show that he wasn't at fault in the death. Annual contracts usually ran for 51 weeks, and uh, they, they didn't cover the period from Christmas to New Year's. January 1st was generally the first significant hiring day. Now other communities specified special days each month for the hiring out of slaves. Many non-slave holding whites did occasionally rent slaves. And another example of how this the poorer whites kind of wanted to be part of the plantation elite economy. Facilitating the hiring out were agents operating much like slave traders. Their job was to get renters for those with slaves. And sometimes the hiring out agents were simply slave trader wannabes, not, not yet moved up, but others took pride in their work. Here we see a uh, hiring out contract. The work of a slave hired out varied as to, you know, obviously whom rented them. Some would work as an extra field hand at harvest time. Others were hired out by companies to work in factories, mines, or on the railroads. Here you can see uh, of slaves working as, as part of a hired out slaves as part of a distillery. They uh, in towns they might be hired temporarily as servants or messengers, porters or cooks. A canal company might get them to do digging. Like slave trading, the the practice of hiring out flourished, and the price of rent went up as the years passed. Throughout the antebellum age, the price had often grown to five or six hundred dollars per year. The highest prices at the end of the antebellum age was in Texas. With the prices of slaves rising and with hiring out growing, it's not surprising to find that despite the Constitution's 1808 prohibition on the international slave trade, it continued throughout the antebellum age. It was obviously tough for the U.S. to enforce 
thousands of miles of its seacoast, the profit margin was too high for the traders. You might think of like drugs today. The British Navy patrolled the west coast of Africa, but illegal slave traders, it was so profitable, they'd go around the, uh, the bottom of Africa and, and, and get slaves on the east coast of Africa. In 1839, President Martin Van Buren, just after Jackson, asked for a constitutional amendment to overturn the prohibition in order to, quote, preserve the integrity and honor of the flag, unquote. Too many people were simply flouting the law. Almost every year in the antebellum age, you can see leaders calling for tougher enforcement against the illegal slave trade. Illegal international sl uh, traders knew that they had uh, you know, additional advantages. They were often bonded out after arrest, which they simply forfeited and fled because it was, it was again, it was so profitable they could afford it. Sometimes the, if, if they were brought to a court in the South, the, the court simply refused to prosecute or, or juries simply refused to convict. And so the uh, internet, illegal international slave trade continued in the Annabelle Mage just as the hiring out of slaves grew and the... Uh, domestic slave trade group. This concludes the uh, the video on the the development of this uh, the slave trade network in the uh, Annabelle Mage.